Every now and then when I prepare a message, thanks guys, awesome. You, you could stay all day, it creates a great atmosphere. Thank you. But every now and then when I prepare a message, I get tested on it while I'm preparing. So I asked the Lord if I could change my message because it was getting really tough. It's been an incredibly tough week in many, many ways, but actually, I guess the message is for me first. It's for all of us. It's not to preach at people, but it's to share with people together so that we get the help that we need in these challenging times. Today is World Mental Health Day. I was told before in the foyer. And I don't need to tell you that mental health is right now a major, major issue around the world and in our nation and suicide rates have never been higher. In Australia, the lucky country, we're seeing rates of suicide that you'll find the newspapers won't report on them because it'll only get more people doing it. And we're living in very, very challenging times. And yet I'm glad today that I don't have a religious experience. I have a God experience that is very, very real and it can help me in all seasons of my life. And so today I wanna share on prison principles because most people I talk to in Victoria, New South Wales and around this country, not as much as South Australia, but even here, are saying, I feel caged in. I feel I'm in a prison. We all know today that we don't need to be in a physical prison to be in prison. We can be caged in with disappointment, despair, discouragement, being let down. And preparing this message this week's been a challenge for me. We all have prisons we feel we're in. Sometimes they time constraints. I've never seen so much road rage like I'm seeing right now, even on our roads. And people in a hurry all the time and angry. Someone stopped me one day and said, can you please tell me the fastest way to the city? I said, are you, are you walking or are you driving? He said, I'm driving. I said, well, that's the fastest way. <laughs> so um, had to get one in there. I told such a good dad joke last Sunday in the foyer and all morning I'm trying to remember it and I can't. <laughs> so I put that one in there just to fit in for the other one. This week, I haven't had an easy week. On Monday holiday, we had to rush my dad to hospital. My dear friends are here today that called the ambulance for my dad. And he was in emergency at Modbury for about 24 hours and he didn't look like he was gonna make it. It wasn't a good day. But you know what? If you saw him now, he's still in hospital because he stopped eating properly and he didn't get hydrated and he ended up with kidney failure and, and his potassium levels were so high, he was getting delusional. And yet I sat with him in hospital yesterday and he looked like a new man. And I thought about it and I thought, he didn't put all the right stuff in his body and it got him really ill and he came close to death. By putting the right stuff in his body, he's come back to life. We have a generation out there that's been putting all the wrong stuff into their lives and then wondering why life sucks. But I wanna tell you today, if we put the right stuff in, no matter what situation we are in, we can be healthy, we can be strong, and we can have hope in our lives. At times we all feel overwhelmed and in a place of restriction and we can feel darkness all around us. But the good news is we don't have to waste our lives and time when we feel we're in a prison. Last week I was at Burnside Village and I was waiting for a shop to open and I was sitting there and I was getting annoyed because my glasses were fogging up, even with the spray stuff you put on them once you got a mask on. For me, it doesn't work. And I'm sitting there and I'm getting agitated and over little things. The shop opened a little late and I'm sitting there getting annoyed. I think, why am I getting so annoyed? And I started thinking of how people feel caged in when things don't go the way we want. And, and I started to think of my mind, in my mind about people in prison in the Bible. 
and how they handled their prison. I thought of four people. The first one that came to mind was a young man called Joseph who was thrown into prison for doing the right thing. He was thrown into prison because he refused to sleep with his boss's wife. She threw herself at him and he was only a young man. He was probably 17, 18 when he got his dream from God. And now only a short time later, he's in Potiphar's house, his boss's house, and she throws herself at him. He does the right thing. He keeps his integrity and he gets thrown into prison by a lie. You would feel really ripped off, wouldn't you? You'd feel like, I might as well have slept with her. I got thrown into prison for doing something that I didn't do and he's in prison and I don't know about you, but often when we feel we're in a place that's not fair, it's just not fair, we feel like giving up. And there he is in prison, having been given a dream by God that now looked like it was never gonna happen. And two guys in the prison have a dream. And he looks at them, he doesn't say, don't tell me your dream, because dreams suck. They don't come to pass. Here's a guy who doesn't know what's happening in his own life and he turns to two guys in the prison with him and he goes, tell me your dream. For God alone interprets dreams. Wow. I remember as a young man in my 20s, reading that story in Genesis 40 and reading about Joseph and this is the thought that came into my head that stayed with me now, I'm 65. You can't be a leader unless you can interpret other people's dreams when you can't interpret your own. I thought, wow. There's been times when I, I've sat with couples struggling in their marriages and, and, and giving them advice when I had my own challenges at home. One of the greatest lies of the enemy to Christian people is you're a hypocrite. And you know what? We're all broken. And it's not about perfection, but it's about direction. And we go in the right direction. And when we fall, we get up because we have a God that can help us interpret even other people's dreams when we can't interpret our own. It's carried me through life. And so here's this young man and he's in prison but he speaks prophetically in his prison. Then I thought of Peter. Here's the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 12. He gets thrown into prison, he gets arrested. The Apostle James has just had his head chopped off or he's been murdered, he's been killed. And now he's thrown into prison. And what does Peter do? In the most dangerous time of his life, surrounded by four groups of guards, watching so he could chained to a bed so he couldn't escape. And he's snoring his head off. Probably had a bit of sleep apnea, but anyway, he, he, was, he was going for it. He was sleeping. He was in a sound sleep that when an angel comes to deliver him from the prison, they have to shake him and wake him up. And I thought of that and I thought, you know, as Christians, we should be people that when we feel restricted and in prison and like we feel in our world today, we should speak prophetically, not negatively like Joseph did, but we should also have peace. See, Peter slept because he had peace. Joseph spoke prophetically. Peter slept peacefully. And then I think of another couple and that is Paul and Silas. But before we go to Paul and Silas, the thought just comes to my mind right now. How does Peter sleep in the midst of a prison of possible losing his life. Well, maybe one day when he was following Jesus as a disciple and they were out fishing on the lake and a storm rises up in the lake and Jesus is asleep in the midst of the storm in the boat. And it was Peter that comes to Jesus and shakes him and goes, don't you care that we perish? Don't you care? Jesus cared, He was just showing them that in the storm, we can find peace. In the storm, we can find rest. In fact, when Peter gets to the end of his life, in 1 Peter chapter five, he's an old man. He's now giving people instructions. He's going, cast all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Where did Peter learn that? He learnt that in the boat. 
He learnt it by watching Jesus. And now his own life is in danger. He's in the midst of another kind of storm and he's in prison and he's fast asleep. And he slept because Joseph spoke prophetically. Peter slept peacefully. But then we meet another couple. They weren't husband and wife. They were two guys, Paul and Silas, thrown into prison for doing something right. And being thrown into prison, they sang passionately. Can you imagine that? Thrown into a prison, beaten to a pulp. They're thrown into prison, bleeding, bruised, and they're singing their hearts out in a way that was so powerful that it shook the prison. We had an earthquake apparently in South Australia yesterday, but uh, this shook the whole place. An earthquake came through their singing and what they ended up doing was they sang passionately in their prison. Peter slept peacefully in his prison. Joseph spoke prophetically in his prison. This should be the greatest time on earth for Christians. Please don't get caught up with all this conspiracy stuff. There's Christians running around in fear. There's Christians running around saying, what are we gonna do? This should be the happiest time for the church because in our storms, we can prove what we believe. In our storms, we can prove that our God is real. In our storms, we can speak prophetically. In our storms, we can sleep peacefully. In our storms, we can sing passionately. And I was in the shopping centre thinking about that and I thought, what a great time for us to be the light of the world. What a great time for us to show people that life can be good at all times when we know that God is with us and He equips us to do these prison times. I wanna take the Paul and Silas story this morning just for a few moments. I wanna read the story, a bit of reading here. And then I'm gonna give you some prison principles when you're in a prison of restriction, when you're in a prison of feeling I can't break out, I pray that these steps will help us today in doing this time in history. And you know what? It's not the worst time in history. Try living through the Holocaust. Try living through six million Jews being wiped out. You wouldn't blame them for thinking the Antichrist had come. And I wanna tell you, we are living closer to the return of Jesus and the Bible prophetically shows all kinds of signs, but we should not spend most of our time dealing with the negative. We should be a people that in the midst of all that stuff, do not get caught up in that stuff, but we speak prophetically or we sleep peacefully and we sing passionately. And it's not religion, it's reality. I tell you, even in the midst of... You noticed at the grand finals that we've just had, they still shouted. Nobody at the grand finals were going, we better not sing because life sucks. <laughs> still fighting for their teams to win. I still can't work out how they can allow that many people to go to a footy match, but people can't worship in church. Anyway, I'm getting negative now. Let's move on. <laughs> See, I rest myself, stop it. Let's read Acts chapter 16. I'll start at verse 16 and we'll stop around verse 33. One day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. 
He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Do you know how many people today wanna kill themselves because of what people think? Look at TikTok and look at all those social media things and people today no longer live to who they know they are. They live to who they expect people want them to be. And so here's the jailer about to kill himself because he was worried about what would happen and what people would think because these guys had escaped. Stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. What an incredible, incredible story. And it's a story that I think can show us some incredible principles of how we can live when we're in a place of restriction, when we're in a place of misunderstanding, when we're in a place of being misunderstood. Paul went through so much stuff in his life. You think, what kind of successful Christian was he? And yet the lessons we learned from how he handled these times of imprisonment are life-changing experience. We often say, it's not fair. I don't deserve this. I remember when our son passed away, nearly six years ago now, still feels like yesterday. But the number of people that came to me and go, this is not fair. It's not fair, you don't deserve this. You're a good family. Why do bad things happen to good people? I'd like to ask the question, who's good? Who's good? You know, I think God determines what's good and we've all got stuff and we don't get what we deserve. This didn't happen to our family because we did or didn't deserve it. We live on a fallen planet and stuff happens. The Bible predicts that stuff will happen to all people on the planet. When Adam fell, he was told by God, you're gonna go through suffering in life. Stuff is gonna happen. You'll go through stuff. He also told him that his wife is gonna try to dominate him or we won't go there. (laughs) And then he says to his wife, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna try to control him and and he's gonna get mad and he's gonna try to push you around. Well, that's come to pass a lot. My wife hasn't spoken to me for three years. She didn't want to interrupt me. But anyway, uh, um, (laughs) some of the old ones are coming back now. It's not fair, well, what's fair? But I must be honest with you, Chris, who was a pastor at this church, had a wonderful calling on his life. Preached me under the table. He was an incredible speaker and preacher. And yet he was taken. And for a little while, I would sit at home and go, why? Why? God allows for our humanity to express itself. But I can say to you today, it didn't take long. And I realised I would never get that answer. So I had to quickly make the decision on what, not why, do I do now? And it's the prison principles in the Bible, not just one, not just two, but the whole Bible. While I couldn't read it for a while because I was so broken over the loss of our son, after a while started to give me hope in the midst of my prison, in the midst of my pain. Misunderstanding, mishandling, mistreatment comes to most of us. We've been let down in relationships. We've been let down with promises made that haven't been kept. I was an idealist in my early teens, coming from an Italian background. I thought if you feed everybody, If you hug everybody, if you love everybody, they'll be your friends for life. And it's amazing going on the journey of life, who sticks around and who doesn't? Who stays as a friend, who doesn't? And at times you can feel misunderstood as a leader in the church. I remember in the early days of starting Edge Church, 
I would do counselling for hours on end with couples that were going through challenges and sometimes because they had no unity in their relationship and there was nothing in common, the only thing they could attack that they had in common was the church. So they would start attacking the church. Church wasn't there for me. Church didn't do this for me. I turned to the church. I'm getting a little sick and tired of people in the community saying, I hate religion and I hate the church and dismiss the God that's behind it all. Because people make mistakes. Human beings go to church and they're not perfect, but we have a perfect God we cannot ignore just because people that call themselves these kids stuff up. And I remember at times doing my best in some of these counselling sessions and then people would leave and attack. I didn't like what he said, I hated what he said. And you know what I used to do? I used to hear the gossip come back and I'd start defending myself. That's not what I said. That's not what happened. And I would, I, I would lash out and I realised after a while, what a waste of time. Because when people make up their mind about something, you can't change it just by telling the truth because they have what Oprah calls their truth. There's no such thing. There's only truth. You can't have your truth and I have my truth. There's only truth. And so as I looked at the story, I learnt some lessons. Here they come. Very quickly, number one. Paul and Silas in prison, number one, didn't waste time getting mad. Can you imagine Silas, who never said anything, He's just the silent partner with Paul. They get into prison, their backs are bleeding and he goes, you idiot. If you hadn't opened your flipping mouth, <laughs> right now we'd be on, at that prayer meeting we were going to. She never said anything wrong. What she said, but Paul picked up the spirit that was inside of her and he knew what was going on behind the scenes. And so he speaks out, Silas is singing harmonies. He's singing with Paul like nothing happened. They never got mad. They didn't say, why did this happen to us? We don't deserve this. They could have been forgiving for thinking, we should have kept our mouth shut. But they gave no oxygen to getting mad because getting mad doesn't mend. Getting mad doesn't mend anything. It's wasted energy. God understands our humanity, but we have to manage our humanity by trusting His Sovereignty. I got mad. I got mad at God. Why my son? We'd already gone through a journey with a broken son. Now our elder son. And there are moments we think, how much more? And you know, I got mad a little bit. You know what I felt from God? I'm being honest here, absolutely honest. I felt from God, that's okay. You can get mad at me. You can get mad with me. I'll wait. And when you sort your heart out, I'll be there to guide you. And now five years later, the pain's still there. I walk with a limp, as it were. Our grandson's here today, his eldest son, Zeke. Thank you for being here, Zeke, today. Every time I look at you, I see the same qualities that were in your dad and I'm, I know he'd be so proud of you today. I do. And it hurts. And yet in the middle of that hurt, I can't, I can't get my head around the fact that there is a power, there is a strength, there is a grace that's inside that makes you keep going. But I had to stop giving my energy to getting mad because that wasn't gonna get me anywhere. Number two, they didn't ask why. They could have spent all their time in this prison saying, why is this happening to us? Why are we getting such a bad rap after setting someone free from their bondage? They did a good thing. This lady was demon possessed. She was being controlled. As she's telling people's fortunes, there was an evil spirit driving her life. But the fact is people benefited from her gift and they didn't care about the lady. So the people that cared about the lady get thrown into prison. The people that don't give a rip are outside the prison judging those that did the right thing. There's such 
such a sense in this new generation right now for justice. We have justice generations around us. My daughter's got justice tattooed on her foot. Justice. And you know something? Sometimes we don't get justice. Sometimes we get accused of things that aren't real. Over the many years, I've seen so many unjust things. It wasn't that long ago that I was spoken about on the seven o'clock project about something that I supposedly counselled someone in that was an absolute lie. The project, the Channel uh, 10 project, rang me and spent an hour on the phone with me as I told him the truth. On the project at 7 p.m., they said this, we contacted Pastor Danny, but he was unavailable for comment. Unavailable, an hour on the phone. People watch that stuff every day and think they're getting the truth. I have a passion in my heart to see something rise up that will hold media accountable when they don't tell the truth. And yet, you've heard me say it a thousand times, maybe more, you Christians are brainwashed. Yes, we are. We just choose who washes our brains. (laughs) And the world out there gets brainwashed every five minutes and we take it as truth. And our young people are being destroyed when we have a God who gives us our identity. We have a God who says, I made you in my image. And if you have my identity and you have a revelation of me as deity, I will show you your destiny and you will have authority and you will live in victory. And yet today, people are confused about their identity. I was gonna tell you a joke, but I better move on. It's wasted energy asking why. It only depletes us of our energy of where we should really spend it. Number three, they didn't give the enemy unnecessary attention. Whether you believe it or not this morning, there is a devil. There is an enemy. Just like there is a God, there are evil spirits. And people are being tormented by them all over the world. And yet what upsets me sometimes is when Christians blame the devil for stuff he's not responsible for. And you know, we get all uptight, the devil this, the devil that, the devil that, the devil this. And here in this story, these guys didn't even talk about it. There was no blaming the enemy because it's wasted energy. The the enemy doesn't have the power we often attribute to him. My family background, My family background as an Italian is that people can curse you. My mum and dad grew up in a place called Ponte in Benevento near Naples. They make a liqueur there called Straga, which means witch. And the whole town was involved in witchcraft for many, many years and people would put curses on people. And you'll often see in some of the Godfather movies, guys wearing these chains around their neck with the horns coming out because we can curse people. Every time I got a headache as a kid, my mum goes, somebody's cursed you. And she'd have to go through some ritual. And I go, really? And you know what? I don't wanna spend my time trying to look at the enemy and the government and all the things that aren't right. I'm gonna spend my time singing and praising in the midst of my prison because it's a waste of time blaming the enemy. And you know what? Those of us that are Christians in the room today, we have three weapons against the enemy. Number one is truth. When Jesus was attacked by the enemy in the garden, sorry, in the wilderness, He said, it is written. He didn't say to the devil, he didn't get into conversations with him. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone and starts quoting Scripture to the enemy. And you know what? Every day of my life, I put that word into my heart, not as a pastor, but as a Christian. And when the attacks come, I can say, it is written. It is written. Do you have an it is written in your heart? Because no matter what happens in our world, if you have an it is written, we have power. We sang about it this morning. We have power, the power of the Holy Spirit within us that can empower us. I often feel that empowerment. 
I can't tell you the amount of times every week of my life, at least in the last 20 years, where that little prompting on the inside, ring so-and-so, ring so-and-so, get in touch with that person, do that thing that you need to do and go and buy that and give it to that kid. And I'm going, where does that come from? It's the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that prompts us to do things that bring about an amazing result when we follow through. These are great days, no matter what happens around us, we can live. The next one is allegiance. As, as Christians, we have power of allegiance. Can I say, can I explain it this way? Some mornings, life sucks. Some Sunday mornings, life sucks. And some Sundays, I don't wanna come. But I made a decision years ago that I'm just gonna be consistent. One of the greatest problems is people just aren't consistent. I think I've been in church nearly every day of my life unless I've been sick or in hospital. I went nine months before I was born, so I've always been to church, right? Is that because I'm a churchian? No, because I wanna be consistent. Because one word in a song. I remember the times when one of my sons had broken severely and he was in a mental hospital here in Adelaide. And I would go from church to the mental hospital, from church to the mental hospital. And I'd be at church and the songs would be sung and I'd have my hands raised and I'd be crying and worshipping. And people must have thought, gee, Danny's really close to God. It was my lifeblood. I'm just about to walk into a mental institution. If this isn't real, let's not do it. But if it's real and every Sunday that I would go to Flinders Hospital to visit my son, I, at church first, I would, I would stand there and, and worship and something in a song, something that was preached, something that was said would just fill my spirit. You walk into a mental institute, a Flin, institution at Flinders Hospital, there's a lady in her 80s with Tourette's and she's swearing at the top of her voice. There's another guy with a mitten on his hand and got a guitar and he's playing mitten guitar, stopping me in the foyer and another guy quoting the Scriptures through numbers. One, two, six, eight, ten, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 30, 40, and then quote the Scripture. And the guy totally flipped out on drugs. And then I've got one of my kids in there. Can you imagine that feeling? If I had to live by feelings, I'd say, stick it. But I made a decision I was going to continue. When I gave my life to God, it's like for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. If you can sign the wedding certificate with your blood and you're not going to divorce me, I'm here. It's no point. I talk to pastors. I've got to move. I'll get the hint. Yeah. I've got to move. I talk to pastors and go, most of our people only in church once every six weeks. And while I'm not trying to have a go at anybody for that, this is pre-COVID, you think, no, I need to be a person of allegiance to the faith that I have. I need to be a person that has an it is written inside of me and I have to believe the Holy Spirit inside of me. Let me give you the points real quick. Number four, they kept praying. It says that they kept praying. You know, someone said to me, how did you go when Chris passed with you praying? I said, I couldn't for a while. I didn't know how. But then I realised something was missing in my life. Without that dependency on God, even in the midst of misunderstanding and confusion. Once a man was asked, what did you gain by regularly praying to God? The man replied, nothing. But let me tell you what I lost. Anger, ego, Greed, depression, insecurity, and fear of death. Sometimes the answer to our prayers is not gaining, but losing, which ultimately is the gain. That's what I found. Number five, they kept praising. They kept singing. I think one of the highest forms of worship is singing when everything hurts. I'm moving on. There's stuff here that I, I went off track, so which I never do. <laughs> Paul and Silas didn't fight to be released. They prayed and praised and were increased. 
They didn't get mad. They didn't ask why. They didn't give in to the enemy. They kept praying. They kept praising. Number six, they didn't get bitter. They got better. They didn't get bitter. Bitterness is a, is a horrible thing. We will never be free to know a better place if we stay in a bitter place. Last one, they stayed in relationship. The power of and, Paul and Silas. I thank God that number one, I've got God in my life. But number two, I've got beautiful people that are my ands in life. Who are your ands in life? It was Peter and John, Paul and Silas. The ands in your life will determine how you end your life. Relationship is so important. We need the right people in our lives. I'm not saying this to patronise you, Life Church, but being here with you in a special season in my life and receiving the encouragement and being able to give encouragement, it's been a wonderful and in my life. We all need it. We all need the right ands. But we can have people in our life that are with us in our pain, in our prison, and even our purpose. I was praying, and I'm gonna to come to a close now, but I was praying for this morning. And this is what I felt so strong. Somebody here today, you might be visiting, maybe you've been here for a while. You've just lost your peace. You've lost that sense of, I don't know. Don't know what I believe anymore. And I felt while I was praying this morning very strongly that the greatest key to breakthrough is finding purpose. Don't chase peace, don't chase those things, chase purpose and the peace will come and all those other things will come. A few years ago, as I close, I, I spent a bit of time in Holland. I was doing some ministry over there and I went to visit the house of a lady called Corrie Ten Boom. She wrote a book called The Hiding Place. She was a Dutch lady with her family. They had a watch shop. They used to sell watches and make watches. Still to this day, that company exists. During the Second World War, her and her family decided to find purpose in the storm, purpose in the prison. And they housed Jews that were being chased by Hitler and his army and they were putting these Jews, they built a wall in their house and they were hiding these Jews behind this wall, hundreds at a time. I remember going to the house, which is like a museum today, standing in that house and bawling my eyes out. A lady who was just a watchmaker, didn't see herself as being anybody special, found her purpose. And in the midst of her prison, Yes, she was arrested. Yes, she was thrown into jail. Her sister died. People around her were dying every day. And in that prison, she found a peace because she'd found her purpose. That was incredible. She is the lady they've made a movie about called The Hiding Place. You might be able to download it. She wrote the book. I bawled and bawled my eyes out. Standing in that place, she was born in 1892 and changed her world. She made a couple of statements I'll close with. Is that my third closure? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm definitely closing now. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Worry does not empty tomorrow if it's sorrow, it em of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. The measure of a life is not in its duration, but its donation. Father, today, I can't guarantee to anybody here that life will always be great. 
And if we've told people that, then that's wrong. And we also know, God, that life isn't always bad. We thank You for all the good things. We thank You for the great blessings. We thank You for the great joys. We thank You for our eternal hope. Wouldn't wanna be with anybody else but You, God. And yet there are times we are in prison and we know that You'll bring our soul out of prison so we can praise Your Name. And all these people were released from prison. We thank You that Joseph became the Prime Minister of his nation when he was released from prison. We thank You that Peter was released from that prison and changed his world and turned it upside down. We thank You that Paul and Silas were released and churches were birthed despite their pain. Father, will You fill us with joy today that is supernatural a joy that cannot be taken from us. Father, let us speak prophetically like Joseph. Let us rest peacefully like Peter. And let us sing by putting our trust and faith in You like Paul and Silas, for the best is yet to come. We pray in Jesus' Name, Amen. 